today we are making homemade cat food for under $15. No joke. I am so excited. We are going to take one roast chicken and a few other ingredients. I'm going to leave the chicken there and we are going to turn it into 19 pints of wet cat food. So that breaks the cost down to just about 75 cents per jar, per pint size jar. Right now, the most of the wet cat food that I can find is a dollar per three ounce can, but that's not getting into the designer brands or the organic foods. Those can go well upwards of $2 per three ounces. Some of them are even $4 per three ounce jars of wet cat food. So if your budget is as tight as mine is, hang out, we're going to make some wet cat food. Uh, my name is Joanna Troutman. Welcome to my kitchen. Welcome to my home. I am so excited for today's project. Um, there is going to be a lot that we are going to cover. If this is your first time watching my videos, welcome. I go really in depth into how we do things, why we do them, all the different ingredients we use, why we use them. Um, if this is your 18th video with me, welcome back. I can't wait to uh, hear how this one goes for you. Uh, if you could do me a favor as we get started, go ahead and like and subscribe below uh, so that we can stay connected and help each other out as we do this. All right, our first step. I have already unwrapped my bird. I am going to take this bird and I do want all of the heart and all those other goodies. So I need to get that into my pressure cooker. Uh, by the way, this is my least favorite part of the entire process. I really, really, really don't enjoy working with raw chicken. But I love my kitty cats, so here we are. Now, uh, you'll, there's a lot, there's varying amounts of information about what cats need in their diet. And there's a lot of raw food diets out there. That's just, those, if they work for you, that's great. It is not going to work for my family and my kitchen. Uh, I know far too much about foodborne illness to want to be serving raw food to anyone that lives in my house. Now, I have placed the entire bird, along with the heart and the liver and all the other little goodies, into my Instant Pot inner pot. I am going to add just a little bit of water because if you put it in completely dry, there's a very good chance that it will... Um, burn. And that's time consuming. I'm adding some filtered water to it. This is reverse osmosis filtered water. And again, just adding about an inch to two inches. So there's some water in there to start. I'm going to add just a little bit more. Okay. Now, the purpose of this first step is to cook down this bird. I want the bones soft enough to snap. So we are going to add one more ingredient. This is two tablespoons or one fluid ounce of apple cider vinegar. That is safe for the cats, but adjust the pH of the water and it will help leach the minerals out of the bones, which because we preserve all the cooking water and incorporate it into our wet cat food, it's super nutritious. Um, all right, the bird is in the pressure cooker. We are going to make sure you have your seal inside the, the lid of your pressure cooker. Make sure you have, this weight is removable. Make sure that it is put back on your pressure cooker lid. And you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug this one in so you can hear all the chimes. All right, it says off. I'm gonna start putting the lid on. Mine makes sounds. If yours is the same brand, same model, it's gonna make the same sounds. If it's a different brand, it may not make any sound at all, but just make sure you lock that lid in place. All right, next step, you're gonna make sure that your weight, it may be set to venting. You need to set it to sealing because we are going to pressure cook this, kit, this chicken. All right, next step, we need to set our timer. So, 
I am selecting poultry. 30 minutes is great for cooking the meat, but it is not enough to cook it down to where the bones easily snap. I'm going to take it all the way up to an hour and five minutes. And that step is done. The only other step that we are going to do right now is, all right, so now the pressure cooker has started the process of adding heat. It will continue to add heat until the inside of the chamber becomes pressurized. At that point, you're gonna see the little escape pressure escape valve will pop up and your timer will start. Your timer does not start until this unit achieves, it's usually yeah, 10 to 12 pounds of pressure. It, that's gonna vary a little bit by machine. Um, but your timer, again, does not start until this thing is fully pressurized. And that is what makes pressure cooking different than say just regular stovetop cooking. All right, the other step that we are going to do right now while we have started the pressure cooking process is we are going to soak our white rice. Right now, this is just basic, inexpensive white rice. Um, some people are, feel very strongly that their cat food should not have any carbohydrates in it. I, all 13 of my cats are healthy weight and they get a lot of exercise. So I feel comfortable giving them some easy, simple carbo, well, complex carbohydrates to break down. But what we are doing right now is we are adding some filtered water to it. That helps pull any arsenic and other toxins off the coat of the grains. And then after this has soaked for a good half hour to a little, I'll, I'll actually leave it for as long as the chicken pressure cooks. And then we can rinse it a couple of times. That will get all hopefully a lot, if not all of the gunk off of it. So we're going to let that sit. We are going to let this pressure cook and we're going to check back on it when the timer goes off. All right, the timer is about to go off. Do not open your instant pot or pressure cooker yet. When that timer goes off, that does not mean that this is actually ready. It simply means that all of the heating elements inside are going to turn off. Um, if you chose to open it right now, this unit is fully pressurized and that is where you have explosions inside a kitchen. All of the contents inside this would go everywhere, all over. All right, so my timer just went off. On my electric pressure cooker, it changes the timer to L for low and then it's doing basically a keep warm cycle. I'm gonna go ahead and hit cancel because I really don't need it to keep anything warm. Um, I'll unplug that in a minute. Uh, I am not yet ready to depressurize the contents. At this point, once we open the Instant Pot, we are going to start adding all of our ingredients in, which means I'm gonna unplug my Instant Pot and move it over and move my blender where I can use it more easily. This is the pitcher that's designed for wet ingredients, which this will fall into. Um, I have one pound of frozen mixed vegetables, one cup of ground flaxseed, a quarter cup of uh, wheat bran, a half cup of nutritional yeast, 15 ounce can, this is commercially canned, 15 ounce can of uh, pumpkin, uh, not pumpkin pie filling, two very different things one tablespoon of turmeric, a quarter teaspoon of black pepper, four large eggs, one quarter cup of coconut oil, and right here, this is a new addition. This is um, taurine, a supplement in supplement form. And I'm gonna explain um, this recipe by the guidelines that are given. It doesn't actually need it but I will explain the, the impact that it makes and you can put it in if you would like. As you can see, this isn't much. This is a, the equivalent of four grams of torque. All right, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and release the pressure on my pressure cooker. 
to do this, you're going to take your finger and very carefully, you are going to move the release valve from sealing to venting. If you have a different brand, it's probably gonna look a little bit different, but the concept is the same. There's going to be a way to basically open up the valve, which will let steam escape straight up. So that means I want my face away from the top of the Instant Pot. Steam burns are very painful. I have inflicted them on myself. Um, my face away from it. I'm gonna bring my hand in from the side rather than on top. I don't want my hand above it either. So I'm going to nudge it over. And it is now releasing steam. That is why you don't open it. There's so much pressure inside this cooker. And as you can see, my pressure cooker is completely unplugged. So it is hot and pressurized still. So what we're doing is we're releasing the pressure, which will let the temperature start to come down. And also it makes the contents settle back down inside the container. And once the steam has stopped escaping, once the steam has stopped escaping, eventually the little silver button that's next to it will fall back down. I'm not gonna put my finger in there yet. So once we don't see any more steam billowing out of the top of it, because right now the only thing holding that silver button up is the pressure from inside the container. But soon it'll release. Now I have a separate stock pot ready because this recipe is too large to fit inside the Instant Pot. So we are going to, I, I transfer it into a stock pot which I will then warm up on the stove. Um, while we're waiting for that, we can go ahead and rinse our rice. Grab your rice. You can still hear that hissing. It needs plenty of time. Um, I'm using filtered water to rinse it. You don't have to. I just feel a little bit better about it and I have it available to me and I can. All right, so here is the use of this particular style, style colander. It's not super heavy duty, but it is fabulous for finer things like rice and quinoa, um, small berries, that type of thing. It's great for that. Now, if you are straining four pounds of pasta, this, this particular colander or strainer would not be as helpful. It'd be difficult to use. All right, that is fairly rinsed. Going to rinse my bowl because I'm not ready to put it in the pot quite yet. I'm going to put all this back in the bowl. See, all empty. There it is. Now it is. It'll be ready to add in and check it out. All right. While we were doing that, this uh, button, the pressure button, it fell back in, which means it is completely depressurized in there. And we have a very cooked chicken. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put the lid straight in my sink. Now, this chicken is hot, 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 hot. So you're gonna start grabbing bits of it. I would start with a leg. And we're gonna be basically coarsely pureeing it. So I am using tongs so I don't use my hands. And I'm gonna start adding in some of these other ingredients. All right, I used four eggs in this recipe to up the protein as well as choline and some of the other um, nutrients that are in eggs. But also the egg shell is a decent source of calcium. Hence, you see the bones, the chicken bones are still in our blender too. That's why we have to use a high pressure blender. Um, Excellent uh, source for phosphorus, calcium, and magnesium. I'm gonna put a little bit of the pumpkin in. So, you could put, like I'm putting all the turmeric in on this particular one. 
It doesn't matter because it's all going to be cooked together in the end, but you don't want to overload your blender. So I'm going to do some of the veggies. And some of the flaxseed. A little bit of the other. Now I do the, the flaxseed and the, um, the wheat bran and the nut nutritional yeast. You can see they're already fine pieces, but what I found is if I don't blend them like this, they clump up. If I just add them directly to a pot of simmering cat food, I end up with clumps of this other stuff and that's not helpful to me. All right, so we are going to end up putting all of the liquid from our chicken in there. Um, however, we're going to need to add some water or else this is going to completely bog down the blender. Also, if you get it too thick, it will not can properly and it, it basically it expands too much and the, the jars don't seal well. So, when you're using your blender, you want to at least cover your solid ingredients with liquid. All right, let's give this a shot. Now this blender is designed to be able to handle hot as well as cold food. Make sure that yours can before you do it. All right, let's see, power on. Ooh. All right, power on. extremely liquidy but that's okay very high in protein it means that as it gets closer to solid temperature or as it gets closer to room temperature it becomes more solid that color is from the comp well mostly from the turmeric but also the pumpkin contributes to that color but really the turmeric is your big contributor for that now rather than, I'd rather have that lid, my stopper and stuff in my blender drip into the pot. So that's what I do with that. Let's get some more chicken. We're gonna load this thing up again. And this is gonna take a few rounds in the blender. This is all gonna vary based on how much, what you, the capacity is of your blender and all that good stuff. But we seem to be doing pretty well here with this. Now, if you find your chicken is just not like coming apart easily enough, this is blending okay. But if you're finding it does not, it, it's not enough to snap the bones, go ahead and put it all back in your pressure cooker and pressure cook it for another 15 minutes. And that should probably do the trick. It is just, it's time and pressure and heat that get these bones brittle enough and soft enough that uh, they can snap. Because what happens is that cooking process, if we threw out the water that we were cooking in, we would lose a lot of nutrition. Because what happens during this cooking process is the minerals are literally pulled out of the bones by the heat and the water. So, yeah, boiled meat, if you just take it out of the boiling water and cast out the water, you're, it's not as nutritious as other cooking methods. But if you retain the cooking liquid, oh look, there's some of our organ meat. See how dark that is? That organ meat is also higher in taurine. Um, and your dark meat, like your legs and your thighs, higher in taurine as well. Interestingly, this white meat, the coveted chicken breast, is not the most helpful part of the bird for your cats. The dark meat is actually far more nutritious for them. All right, I'm gonna let that go. We're gonna add some of these veggies. And you see, I just dropped the eggs in whole because they blend right up. Let's see. More of this. And let's 
go ahead and get that taurine in. And again, the taurine, because we're blending it into the liquid and then we'll cook it as a whole into the larger mix, it is going to be spread that way. Okay, a little bit. My kitchen's a little chilly, so my coconut oil is super solid. If you make that when you make this recipe in the summertime, or if your kitchen gets to be closer to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, your coconut oil is going to be far softer, much closer to a liquid. All right, let's get a little bit of the juice. Oh, that's not juice, but the cooking liquid. Our final run in the blender is going to be the liquid from the uh, chicken anyway. But there is far too much dry ingredients in here. That'll tear up my blender. It needs more liquid. concerned about maybe it being too much of a puree for your cats. Mine are fine with it, but I also feed my cats kibble along with this, and that way they get to chew something. You can always hand chop or hand tear up some of the meat, but you need to get it to a pretty decent speed to grind up the bones. That is why I use enough speed to get it that smooth. You see why there, there's not a particular order for this part of it. It really, it's all going, <laughs> it's all going to the same place. And we'll do it, the final egg. Do the nutritional yeast. This was a total of a half cup of nutritional yeast. This was a total of a quarter cup of wheat flour and one cup of flaxseed. Now the nutritional yeast, it adds some extra B12. Cats are typically fine on B12 because their meat is high in it anyway. But it also is a great protein source and they're finding that in mammals, nutritional yeast has something in it that helps the immune system. They haven't figured out the mechanism yet, but the cats enjoy it, it's not bad for them, and if they get a marginal benefit that helps keep them from getting sick, I'm all for tossing it in. It's also great in human food for the same reason. Um, the pumpkin, it obviously boosts the vitamin content as well as some soluble fiber, which the cats can handle. It keeps their stools softer, but what you get along with it um, is the, well, actually it's the soluble fiber. Um, the vitamin A, and uh, my cats actually really enjoy the taste of it. Now, I don't give it to them plain, they are carnivores, but they do enjoy the flavor of it in with their other stuff. The um, coconut oil, medium chain triglyceride, it is excellent for their coat, helps keep them nice and shiny, and also they, they run really well on fat, high fat, high protein diet. Uh, the, and we talked about the eggs. The wheat germ gives them a little bit of fiber, not much because it's so such a small part calorically, but it does give them some of that as well as some extra minerals. The mixed vegetables, we are go that that was more of the vitamins that you add to it. Not a lot of calories because val uh, the vegetables are so low calorie compared to the bulk of the calories coming from the chicken. Um, but a little bit of fiber, a little bit of vitamins, and um, just it just adds a little bit to the fat food. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna see if I can get the rest of this in. What 
I'm doing. Mm. I don't know if I want to get it too full. That works. There's, there's my spatula. I don't want to miss any of any of this chicken stuff. The skin, the organ meat, the carcass, the gristle. It all goes in. That's what's left of our chicken. <laughs> Not much. Okay, this is going to be a full blender. And I did not add water to this one because there was enough liquid from my chicken cooking liquid. This one, we're going to take it up to speed slowly though, it's full. <laughs> which I'm going to dump right here. Now the way we're going to add the rest of our liquid to this, I'm just scraping, scraping the right side of the bowl. Went to the effort of adding it in. You don't really want to waste any of it. my blender because I still need to add fluid or liquid water to my recipe I'm going to rinse down the sides of the pitcher to catch the big stuff and add that water and one more that gets it about halfway full, which this is a 64 ounce jar. So I'm, I'm not quite adding 64 ounces of water. Let's see. Yeah, that's an extra. So about six more cups of water. And that, again, that is because with adding the rice back, rice into this recipe, it thickens it, but also it needs the liquid to soak, like the rice soaks up that liquid along with the chicken liquid. So this is not the same as, as adding in, say, already cooked rice to your recipe and being like, well, my cats don't like it. Well, this, this rice has been super saturated in chicken, so they're going to like it. All right. It's gonna get a little noisy. I have a gas cook range, so I need to run the fan right now. I am going to also, what I have back here, I have two pressure canners. We're actually gonna end up using one fully loaded and then one partially loaded um, because this, to get the 19 um, pints. So I'm gonna turn the burner on for my canners. For me, I put it a little bit over medium. And then with this rice, yes, I want it to warm up, but if I put it on the burner on high, this recipe scorches very quickly. So let me get a wooden something to stir with. I like the wood, the bamboo stuff better than just a basic spatula because you have to keep this particular recipe kind of moving 
getting that rice will settle to the bottom, the chicken settles to the bottom, and it scorches quickly. So you've got to keep it moving. Now, you'll notice I already had water in my canner along with the jars. That is so it heats up um, evenly. If you forget to put the water in your canner, I have done this, this is why I'm telling you this, if you forget to put the water in your canner and you go ahead and heat it up, you are going to have jars exploding. Not just cracking, some of them full on explode inside the canner because they get hot too fast and the glass simply breaks. It's not made for that. But when there's water in there, that insulates it and heats up the glass evenly, which is why you, you, you need to heat the glass up because you're gonna be putting hot food in it and then returning it to the canner and then pressurizing it. And yes, this is not a ready in five minutes type of food, but after I complete this process, I will be able to store this cat food in my pantry versus in a freezer or in the fridge for several months versus just, you know, less, around a week if it's in the fridge or six months at most in a freezer where you're paying for electricity to keep it cold. All right, that will need to continue to heat up. Let's go ahead. I'm gonna need my measuring cup from over there, the one that we used. Tongs can go in the sink, but I will need my measuring cup. All right, this towel, as I pull my hot jars out of the canner in order to fill them, you do not want to put them on a cold surface like a cold stone or, you know, whatever your, your counter is made of. It's cold and you don't want to put the hot jars against it, so you use a towel. I have a washcloth because, and I'm going to demonstrate this, but after we put the chicken in or the cat food, we're going to dip the washcloth in white vinegar and it cleans the grease off the top part so it can create a good seal. The other thing we need to do right this minute is I need 19 lids. These have already been washed. And I always put an extra couple in just in case. Now this can just be tap water. They need to be at least covered in water. And these, you're not going to bring it to a boil, but you can bring it to a very, very low simmer. So they get their own burner, and I do that with the lid on. So I just put that on medium, not on one of my big burners, but on a, oh, a medium burner medium temperature on a medium sized burner. All right, I already felt it starting to stick a little bit at the bottom. Let's see if I can get any of that. You'll see it just thickens right up again. And we wanna get this hot, hot enough to start cooking the rice because that is what's going to let us can it effectively. If uh, if you do not wait for that rice to expand a little bit, you need to leave extra room in your jars uh, or else it, the, the seals won't take. Like it's just literally too much pressure inside the jars as the rice expands and, and you end up with a mess. I've done that. <laughs> Learn from that particular mistake. This, so canning the, the cat food is probably the most challenging canning project, project that I take on. But we are going to give this a few minutes and let everything heat up. I'm gonna be back probably in about 10 minutes. Once all of this is nice and warm and I'm gonna show you how to load up the jars. All right, it's been about 10 minutes. You'll see I put the lids loosely on my canners. That's to keep the heat in and help them to heat up a little bit more efficiently. If you look at the cat food itself, Mine is definitely boiling. I've had to stir it pretty regularly um, because it does stick. It absolutely does stick. Um, see, there's a little bit that was sticking when I just pulled up that dark brown. It's still fine, but 
All I do is scrape it off the bottom with the wooden spoon. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the burner off on my cat food. I had to turn the burner off on my lids because if you look, when you see all the bubbles on the surface of your lid, you've got steam coming off. That is warm enough. If you get them too hot, you won't get as great of a seal. You'll notice that during that 10 minutes, I took a few minutes and did the dishes to kind of catch the kitchen back up and keep it from being too big of a mess. But at this point, I'm going to pull my big lids off and yep, I'm starting to see the bubbles on the surface of my glass jars in there, which means that they're heating up nicely. You can actually see a little bit of steam as well. Obviously not scorching hot because I can touch the pot, but it's definitely warm, very warm. All right, I'm left-handed, but I can use the jar grabbers with both hands because I practiced a lot. I like to get them out two at a time, but I'll just go down to one because most people don't have two sets of the canning tools. You'll see how I hold them. Um, you're gonna figure out how it works in your hand. There's not any particular right way to pull them out, but as I pull them out, I tip it to the side carefully because I don't want that water to splash on me. That hurts, I've done that. Carefully set it on there, and again, you never want to stick your hands in a can. I go ahead and pull all eight of these out. I'm gonna move my measuring cup out of the way. You're gonna see where that comes in a second. And I like two rows of four because I like it. You could do two rows of three and one row of two. You could only do four at a time. That is also perfectly acceptable. But you'll see I've got all sorts of stuff like right within reach. That's going to be very important during this. Where's that last one? And also, as I'm pulling them out, I am checking them for cracks and other flaws because if you put food into a crack, a crack jar and then pressurize it in the pressure canner, that jar is going to break very dramatically right along the fault line of the initial crack. Funnel. This tool, I never really understood the value of funnels until I started working on our car and, and also canning. Funnels are just fabulous little tools. Okay, my food, nice and hot. You can see the steam escaping. You want something that's a fairly liquid consistency. You do not want it solid or super chunky when you're trying to can it. It will make your life miserable and chances are it will not create a good seal. And keep in mind, I am left-handed. If you are right-handed, your process is gonna look a little different than this. But I try and scrape the excess off the outside of my measuring cup. And I like to work from my farthest one to my nearest one. All right, that is plenty in that cup. That's about one inch of headroom. Uh, you don't want to go any less than one inch for the headroom with this particular product. It expands too much during the canning process. And let me show you what I do when I accidentally put too much. So this one's going to accidentally have too much. I'm going to empty my measuring cup. You can use like a tablespoon, but this is one of those scoops that comes in stuff like protein powder. And you know how they're a strange size and you know, most people just throw them out. Well, I like to keep a few of them because for little projects like this, they come in really handy and I end up getting to keep my nice measuring spoon for something where I really care about the measurement. With this, I'm just simply pulling a little bit out to make it level, and I don't care if it's exactly a tablespoon that I'm pulling out. So, little thing, little scoops, multi-purpose scoops, scoops, I suppose you could go with. I'm gonna go to another little scoop. 
sure. Although this front burner is off and you can see the cat food is definitely still warm. Now we're gonna go in for right-handed. We'll see how this goes. I'm not as coordinated with the right hand, but you can see that. You will get used to using your funnels and measuring cups. It'll probably end up looking slightly different. And mine. That one's going to have a touch too much. But the beauty of using a funnel um, is that it keeps the sides and the rim relatively clean, which is important for getting a really good seal with the lid. I'm looking at these. This one I think is a touch high. This one is a touch high. Because looking at the rice, the rice is not fully cooked yet, so it will expand. Yeah, this one's still a little bit high. You can use a, a plastic ruler to get exact measurements. That is completely acceptable in the canning process. I'm not doing that today. All right, my washcloth. This is a clean washcloth. It's a little stained, but it is clean. I'm going to dip it in my white vinegar. This white vinegar is not going back in the bottle because this is, it's, it's gonna be contaminated, but it's fine for this particular use. I am generously rubbing around the rim to make sure there is no, no fat. It could be plant fat, animal fat, motor oil, whatever. Whatever it is, you do not want it on that rim and that will prevent these jars and the lids from creating a good seal. So. This is a very important step. Now, if you're just doing something like pickles or fruit um, preserves, you don't need to use vinegar. You just need to use a damp washcloth or a damp rag. But because we are doing something that has a fat in it or is an animal product, the vinegar is far more effective than uh, water for cutting through the grease or cutting through the, the oil and fat. All right? Um, same reason why on stainless steel vinegar cleans, it cleans the surface more effectively than most other cleaners. All right, next step, I love this thing. This is the magnet on a stick. We are going to get, start getting our lids out. Mine want to come out two at a time, which is not terrible. They're hot, which is why you use the magnet. Now I have, I guess what I like to call asbestos fingers, which means I burn them a lot and I'm not super sensitive, but I still use the magnet for sure. So I'm doing this, they don't need to be perfectly centered yet. When you put that ring on, that is going to center your lids. And you'll know these are not ball branded lids. Um, I use ball branded lids, but uh, these are what I these are what was available to me when I was getting lids. I am not terribly brand loyal on these. Um, the pandemic kind of cured me of a lot of that. All right, next we have the rings going on. Now I can still gingerly and briefly touch the um, the 
rings, but the point of this tool is to hold the jar in place so that you can secure the ring. And as you can tell, I'm not super good with it because I don't usually use it. But it is a good tool and it will keep your hands safe. So this is, in fact, my least used canning tool. I think I have at least two of these that are in really perfect condition because what I tend to do is that. And I just touch it very briefly and go hack, 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 hack. But I did show you how to use the tool. Now look at my rings. That is not a pretty ring, is it? It's got corrosion on it, but you know what? It works just fine for this project, and it is only on the jar for the next maybe 24 hours, which, which includes when it's in the canner and when the jars rest and the seals basically confirm themselves. I could have used my cool tool. Okay, next step. I am getting some of my extra jars that I have off to the side because these need to be warmed up. So, what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to go ahead and load these eight back in. And if you only have a canner that can handle eight pints at a time, like you don't have another tray for double decking, at this point, you're going to go ahead and say, okay, my pressure canner is loaded. The rest of this is going to be pressure canned in the next batch. But I have capacity with running two canners to pressure can a total of 32 pints. So... That's what we're going to do. Now I'm going to start pulling my hot jars out of my second canner. And I'm going to put one of these guys in carefully while using tongs. So the middle one. jars out and please note how I'm not touching them with my fingers right now when they're coming out of the simmering water. And I do not think we will need more than 19, possibly 20 total pint jars. tray that's designed for my pressure canners. This is going to allow me to double deck um, 
my pint jars. Now, regular mouth pint jars in my particular canner are too tall to double deck, but they design the pot in such a way that the wide mouth pint jars, you can double deck and get a total of 16 pints in instead of just eight. Oops. Giving our cat food another stir, putting the lid back on my, I put the lid on my lids. So they stay nice and toasty warm. Giving it a stir, trying to get the stuff that's up on the sides of my stock pot back in liquid. Don't really want to waste much of it. Cat food is pricey after all. And we start the fill up process again. As you can see, you know, you know, I'm going to be able to level this one off between the contents of those two. Too much and then not enough. Let's see. That's actually pretty close. Next step, as we did before, is wiping off the rim of our jars. I'm going to freshen up my vinegar real quick. Being really careful, checking for any little like crumb tidbit of food that could cause that seal to not work right. And it could be just inside the jar or just outside the jar. You want it super duper clear. here the water is starting to get active that means the temperature is rising on it it's making that lid over to my right rattle let's see almost ready for the lids and that means we're almost ready to load up these canners
two here. Sometimes a little bit of water gets trapped in between and creates a bit of a vacuum. It sticks like glue. Nothing like surface tension. Feel free to use that other jar clamping tool to hold the jar while you tighten the ring. It is very useful. I'm going to put three of these up in my second level. I'm doing it in this pattern because I'm anticipating that at most I'll be filling three more of these jars. Remember being careful as I empty the hot water out of the jars. again a couple of jars rather than not have enough ready. That's just me. Okay. Give me one more little stir, scraping the bottom. We are almost there, ladies and gentlemen. And this is the work part. After this, the stove top and the pressure canners do the work. It's pretty cool. Our labor intensive part is going to be all done. My pot is not nearly as heavy as it once was when it had all that cut food in it. Now it's only a little bit more than the weight of the pot itself. Which in this case, it is aluminum, so it is lightweight. And I know I'm going to get comments about using an aluminum stock pot. It is what I have available. Um, a new stock pot this size and stainless is not in the budget yet. I've been replacing my cook bear, cookware piece by piece. And what I would tell you guys is use what you have. There's a really good chance that whatever you have, you can make it work. Yes, there is risk associated with cooking with aluminum cookware, according to what has been coming out in recent studies. Unfortunately, there's risks right now with walking outside and breathing the air out there. There's just, we're surrounded by all kinds of risks. Right now, this marginal exposure to aluminum, I can live with that. 
I would rather have that, especially because a lot of commercial cookware, whether it's in a factory or in a restaurant, is in fact aluminum. It's not stainless steel. Um, I, uh, I can be okay with that. All right, so we are right now, we're going to end up with 18 and a half pints, which means we had a little bit less water in hers. Now what I could do is add these three back in, add a little bit more water. Um, but it is what it is. This is what happens with a home packed method. It's going to be sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. But this is, in fact, I'm not going to bother to pressure can this 19th jar because I'm going to put it right in the fridge. Putting one pint size jar in the fridge is a lot different than loading 20 of them in there. All right. So, rings on. And these, I'll probably just run them through the dishwasher and make sure they're nice and clean. And they'll be ready for my next project. Make sure you check your lids. Again, if you're using a different manufacturer pot, uh, canning pot, it's going to look a little bit different. But check the gaskets. Make sure anything that's threaded is tightly screwed on. Make sure you have your lock facing you. I put my lid on and then lock it in place. And make sure my pot is centered over the burner. Same thing for my second pot. Now. We have to wait for these to get up to temperature. Just like with our electric pressure cooker, we do not start our timer until our pressure canners pressurize. With this particular model, I will know when it's uh, achieved a boiling pressure when this little valve pops up in the front. Your canner is going to have some indicator like that. With mine, it is that. Um, I have ready the little candy weights that once it achieves pressure, I go ahead and put that over the escape valve, which keeps the steam in and starts pressurizing the candy. We're not ready yet. We're going to give this probably another five, maybe ten minutes to get to a full boil and start pressurizing. And you can see this one is going to be pretty close. If you look at the back of it, there is a plastic emergency release valve. This step being patient with it is super important because if you do not pressure, if this does not pressurize properly, that is when like it just it doesn't get it hot enough to create a good seal and kill the bacteria. So with pressure canning, what you're doing instead of acidifying your food to create, and again that will happen. You see how there's a little bit of water dripping out. As it starts achieving pressure, water is going up a little bit. It just, it's a thing. This one is going to take longer because it has more jars in it. But, I'm going to show you what this looks like when this pops up. And again, yours may look a little bit different, but it's going to have the same principle somewhere in there. Steam escaping. You can tell there's no pressure yet though, because look, the pressure gauge isn't changing. But that thing is going to start popping up. It's going to do it. It's got water on top of it. The pressure is rising. 
Now, if you were just water bath canning, all you're worrying about is that pressure gauge going up and then you start the timer. With this one, it's an extra step in that you wait for it to come to a full boil, which is coming soon. After it comes to a boil, then you can pressurize it. And once your pressure rises to the, the 10 pound, then you seal it. Come on. It wants to pop up. It really does. I can see steam escaping from the other one too, but this one is gonna pop up soon. I think this part is so cool because that then closes that escape valve and I can take my weight and carefully put it over that one. So what I'm going to watch is this gauge is going to start rising in the next couple of minutes. Once it gets to the 10 pound pressure mark, I can go ahead and start my timer and this pressure can for a total of 75 minutes or an hour and Super important, it does cook for a long time, but that's important with any animal product when you are canning it. In similar directions as when you're doing uh, beef stew or chicken noodle soup, it's going to be very similar canning guidance. This one is going to pop up in just a moment. Street class inside the kitchen. I think it's so cool. Alright, I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna continue watching this one, waiting for it to pop up. And you start your 75 minute timer. I wait until both of my gauges hit the 10 pounds. So, or in this case, I'll wait for my second gauge to hit the 10 pounds. But what I will be doing is waiting for this one to pop up so I can put the weight on and then watching the pressure gauge 10 pounds and then setting my timer for 75 minutes. And I will see you back after the, at the 75 minute mark and I will show you the next step. All right, time is almost up. Our 75 minutes is past. I turn the timer off. Here we are back at the camera. There is really only one action we are going to take right now and that is to turn the burner off for both for me for both of my canners so if you're only using one canner turn that burner off I can turn my fan off because I don't have any other gas running right now and after that don't touch anything this is crucial when pressure when pressure canning but um, with a product like this very thick chicken cat food you want to let this depressurize naturally, which means we're not going to accelerate the timing. We're not going to when it, it take the vent off to try and get it to depressurize. If you do that, there's a really high risk that inside your jars could burst at worst, and at best, they just won't seal properly. So from my experience, Patience pays off with this. I am not going to touch these canners again for at least 12 hours. They will be cool to the touch by the time I touch them. Um, they are not cool to the touch right now. I wouldn't even, like you could touch a handle because you know, they're heat safe. 
but the metal parts, it is not safe to touch them right now. You can hear the water boiling in there. That will continue to boil for at least an hour, depending on the temperature in your kitchen. So what you're going to do, you hear that? <laughs> so what, what you're going to do is just leave them alone and very patiently let them settle down, let them calm down, let them depressurize, let the temperature drop until it's room temperature, and then We'll come back at, after, it'll, I'm gonna wait 24 hours. That's what I really like to wait, but 12 hours at least um, is gonna give you good results. Anywhere between the 12 and 24 hour mark is fine. I'm gonna come back, open up, the, take the pressure weights off, open up the canners, and then we'll see what we have for a seal. Um, but again, the only step that we need to do right now after the 75 minutes of cooking is turn the burner off. That's all we need to do. That means removing the heat. Don't move the canners. Don't, just, they're good for the next at least 12 hours. And then we'll see how we did with our cat food. Okay, it has been 24 hours. It is a brand new day and it is time for us to check our work. So canners, are, and I, I, you can put your hand near it to see if there's any heat. There shouldn't be. It's been off for 24 hours. Mine is cool to the touch because my kitchen is cool right now. I'm going to take the weight off, put it to the side. I have one designated place for those weights in my kitchen. Um, make sure you do that for yours. It, to me, it is the easiest piece in this whole setup to lose and you have to have it to pressure can. All right. Opening the canners, even though I know it's cool, I still always open it away from my face. Just like with the electric pressure cooker, it is a excellent rule of thumb. Now, because I was canning something like chicken or any other meat product, um, I'm going to carefully hand wash everything. So I'm gonna put the lid to the side so I can wash it. Now, let's see what we have. First glance. My water looks actually the way I'd, I expect it to. Now, if you have a jar burst during the, the canning process, which it can happen, um, you'll see chicken and other stuff floating around in the water and it's, it's gross, but it's just part of the process. Um, it, it, it can happen. You could, there could be a flaw in one of your jars that you just simply didn't see. That's happened to me. There's been times when I overpacked them <laughs> which hopefully I prevented doing this time, but if you overpack them, they, they can burst. All right, my double decking tray. I'm gonna put that to the side now. Start the room up. I'm gonna get the other eight jars that are in this canner out and in my sink. Uh, you can use soap to wash the outside of them as you check the seal because um, if any of the chicken fat or coconut oil gets on the outside of it, it will stay on the outside and it will attract your cats and anything else that may want to snack on that chicken. So it's very important to get these very clean. All right, you're gonna find too, see how loose that, that ring is? That's what happens, the way these seal in the pressure canner is that inside that ring, the lid vibrates up and down and up and down and up and down until a vacuum is created that creates enough suction to seal the lid on. But until that time, it is the ring that holds it in place. But there is a lot of molecules, or there are a lot of molecules vibrating around. So I'm carefully rinsing all around the ridges because chicken can sometimes stick there and that just gets gross for long-term storage. Now, I'll, I'm in a second. And you see how I'm testing the seal? I'm gently, you could, because this is within, you know, around 24 hour mark, you probably could pop it off with your hands. You don't want to. What you're looking for are seals that are just not there, like at all. And you just lift the lid and it comes right off. Now, all of these rings, I am not going to put a ring back on this jar until I open it 
and take some out and then have to store it in the fridge. And at that point, I put a ring back on it. But for long-term storage, when you are storing home canned goods, you do not, and I repeat, do not store it with the ring. Uh, I didn't know that in my first year of canning. And so when you leave the ring on it, it can corrode to the, um, the lid, but also it can hide when there's actually a bad seal. So if you have a bad seal and you can't see it, you're gonna go to get that jar and all of a sudden you have some really nasty spoiled food to take care of. And anytime you see food that is at all funky, when you have home cooked it, home, home canned it, throw it out, don't take a chance. There are so many um, microorganisms that could actually kill you and at the very least make you very sick or your cat very sick if you chose to take a chance and say, well, the bottom half looks good. It's the top half that looks like it's the wrong color. I can guarantee you there's probably something in the bottom half too. It's the bacteria that colonies aren't big enough to change, to actually change the color of that bottom half. Just don't, it's just not worth chancing. All right, so far this canner, oh, there we go. This one did not work. So that one, I can either choose to store this bit in the fridge, but if I have multiple jars where the seal did not take, I'm putting this one to the side. I'm gonna rinse it again. This one is going to the side. I can. I have two options. I can heat it all back up, sterilize new jars, all that stuff, and then recan it. But with just with just one jar, I'm gonna put it in my fridge and use it in the next few days. So. Let's see, these jars, I'm gonna move them over. I let mine rest for another 24 hours. Uh, and at that point, I will label the lids of my jars with what it is, like chicken cat food um, versus turkey for me. Chicken cat food and then the month and the year that it was packed. All of this stuff gets consumed, but it's best to know when you made it just in case. That is the general, quote unquote rule of thumb, thumb guidelines for uh, pressure for canned goods. All right, second canner, fingers crossed. Okay, ooh, I think the water looks even clearer in this one. Excellent. Lid goes to the side and I'm gonna start pulling these things out. Now, well, um, the water that's in these canners, this water, I am going to put it down the drain because it's got chicken stuff in it. I don't really want to use that on my plants. That's up to you. You could probably put it out in your garden and be fine. Um, it's still too cold for my garden to be valid. So I put this water down the sink. That's up to you. When it is from like canning my beans or something like that, that's going to have high nitrogen content, I absolutely use that water for my plants and they love it. But chicken, eh, I think it would attract my pets to digging around my plants that I don't want them digging in. All right, one can looks good. Okay, see this is a different brand lid. It's got a little spot for the date. I use what I can get. <laughs> you can find, uh, as you keep watching my videos, there's a lot of right ways to do things and a lot of right products. I'm happy to show you what I use, but if you have a particular brand that is just your favorite, stay with it. That's, that's great. All right, so far so good. Four out of four. Five. Six. This is good. Oh, and you'll know there is still um, like a little bit of fat or grease on the outside of them. If when you go to write on them, the permanent marker won't work, that means that you need to take vinegar and spray the lids and then that'll take care of any remaining grease or residue that's on your jar lid so that then you can label them. All right, move these over. Ladies and gentlemen, we have successfully turned a six pound chicken 
In this case, we turned it into 18 and a half pints. Or, let's see. One, two, three, four, four, five, 16, set, yeah, 17, 18, and then I have the other half pint in the fridge already. This one's gonna join it. 18 and a half points, 18 and a half pints of cat food. Now, this recipe, if you're doing it by calories, the average cat that is healthy and active adult um, takes in around 250 calories a day. So if this was the only thing you were feeding your cat, this makes about 42 servings. That's pretty good. 42 servings if it is the only thing you feed your cat. In my house, I use this. I, I use this along with dry kibble, so I don't give my cats two or two. I'm sorry, 250 calories. If I said that wrong before, it's 250 calories. I don't give my cats 250 calories of this a day, um, but it is a decent caloric piece or a decent energy piece of their diet. But it is not the whole thing. That is up to you. Um, again, though, six pounds of chicken. Some other ingredients, total of $15 outlay in ingredients, and I have this much cat food to show for it. Significant savings. Um, thank you for hanging with me. This was a, a great project, and my cats definitely appreciate the effort. I hope your cooking project goes well too. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, and if you didn't before, subscribe, like my video, put comments below. Let me know how you're doing. There's so many great comments have been made on my other cooking videos with people chiming in with things that they've done, things that worked for them. Very helpful. Excellent. Thank you so much.